this. Sometimes you don't even know yourself that what you just did was my baby. Stay with me. I want to welcome our Facebook friends, and I'm going to ask that you give the Lord a clap offering now. Let's give God praise as we welcome our Facebook friends. As we reach out to the nations, I am continuing a teaching from Luke chapter 8. We read verses 22 through 33. And I'm picking up where I left off on Sunday, but I'm going to give you some different teaching points. And those teaching points will focus on what Jesus had a mission and an assignment to do. And the teaching points will also be connected with forcing your faith to work. All right, so I want you to notice, and if you were not here on Sunday, it is worth noting that Satan's greatest threat is that you will keep going and not quit. Amen. You have to understand that at some point, the enemy really thinks you're going to stop praying. The enemy really thinks you're going to stop worshiping. The enemy really thinks that you're not going to trust God. And so he's threatened that no matter what he does, you won't quit. All right? So, you have to understand that there's a lot going on. Number one, God is forcing the circumstances. And then number two, Satan is trying to see whether you'll quit. And a lot of times, get this, quitting becomes attractive. Follow me. Quitting becomes attractive because quitting is easy. Yes, it is. So quitting becomes attractive. And what most people are not aware of, and I want to hit you with this, is that the more you quit, the easier quitting becomes. So if the devil could get you to quit on Monday, you may not make it to Sunday. Okay. Because quitting gets easier. Are you with me? In other words, he is counting on you giving up. Quitting. Now, the disciples have been with Jesus a total of three and a half years. In his ministry. I got a question for you. Is three and a half years enough time to learn something? Can you learn something in three and a half years? Can you learn something in three and a half years? You should be able to learn something in three and a half years. They were with Jesus for three and a half years. But in this verse, notice the verse, tell me what, where it is, the key verse, which one is it? 25. Luke 8, 25. It seems like Jesus is shocked. Because he asked them where 
But what is really interesting, it happened for real for real with me and a group of people that came to me, came with me. We were on this same Sea of Galilee. And after touring, and now we're about to cross the Sea of Galilee, which is actually a huge lake. It is also called in the scriptures the Lake of Gennesaret. <coughs> it is also um, given a third name. I think it was about the third name. So it's the Sea of Galilee, Sea of Gennesaret. Here it is, Sea of Tiberias. <laughs> We're talking about the same. It's named after an emperor. So it's called the Sea of Tiberias. All right, so we were the ocean, and if we ever get over COVID, I'm taking another week <coughs> over the line, and you should plan to go. We talked about it before COVID. We were planning to go. All right, so I took this group with me. And we're in a boat like Jesus and his disciples. And everything was fine. Once we launched, here comes a storm. Like almost hurricane forces. Nothing was happening until we got on that boat. And then we experienced and I read the scripture. The storm came on the lake. And we live what is being written by Luke and the other evangelists about this incident. We actually lived through it. Now, Jesus is in the back laying down, because if you've ever been on a small fishing boat, whoever, Carlette, is steering the um, waters, you know, if you're navigating, if you go from the back. So there was a place on the back where Jesus was sitting and obviously took a nap. All right? He was lying down. He falls asleep. And then here comes the storm. Um, I'm going to pause here to mention something. I, I don't know if you noticed or heard on the news that the Ukrainian army actually destroyed And I saw it early this morning on CNN, and the ship that was destroyed was engulfed with flames, and you could see two or three ships running, leaving the coast. It is amazing how Ukrainians are fighting a superpower in Russia, and they're winning. It has to take some faith, Minister Larry, for them to even decide to fight this war. They knew that Putin had and Russia had a superpower, basically because they have nuclear weapons. All right? I know something about ships. My military background was in the Navy. And I followed the footsteps of my oldest brother. So I was stationed on an island, stationed on the island of Guam. And on one occasion, although my job was dentistry, I was a dental technician. You would know about that, Dorothy, you were vaccinating your son. 
And so I, I uh, there was a, a, a point when we had to bring dental and medical care to people in the island going toward the Philippines, Taiwan, and that area. And so the dentist, my chief commanding officer, myself, and a medical corpsman, was on this ship, um, that one, I sent you a picture, and this ship was the ship I was on. Most of you are not aware of the fact that your bishop was a helmsman. My job was to steer the ship, to drive it in and out of port. It was a battleship but a small battleship that was called a gunboat. And you could steer it, Carlette, from below deck, and you could steer it from the helm. I got trained both ways. What's interesting, Selena, is that when you're at the helms, because this little wheel, you're steering the ship. You can see ahead of you. But when you go below deck, there's another larger wheel that steers the ship, and you can't see what's going on on the outside. I had to learn both ways. Faith is not by sight. You got to navigate and steer through rough waters, even when you don't see it or can't see it. So here's the ship I was on. It's called the USS Tacoma. That ship is now out of, what do they call it? Um, where is it? Uh, it's in dry dock. Uh, or it's out of commission. It's out of commission. All right. But that ship went to Nam. Went to Vietnam. And that ship was used because it was a battleship, smaller size, it was faster, it had live weapons on it, we had to know how to use it. My job was to steer the ship, but I was also trained to use the 40 millimeter uh, machine guns on the second deck, and I also had to work in the back of the ship with the turrets, the big guns, and if you, you could see on the back there was a gun uh, on the back of the ship as well in the front as well. And on the second deck, there are also machine guns, 40 millimeters. So we were trained to, uh, to use those weapons. I want you to know that when we read about and hear about um, Ukrainian army destroying a Russian ship, that is no small thing. All right? The crew that was on the ship with me told me when they got back from the demilitarized zone that they took a lot of hits on the ship, but there was no casualties. I want to use my experience to tell you, number one, faith is not seeing. You got to learn how to navigate in waters of life when you can't see. All right? And not only that, but you have to understand that you're going to take some hits. If you're in warfare, you're going to take some hits. But faith continues to work even when you take some hits. So, Selena, a few months later, my ship is back in Guam, and I meet the captain. And I'm having a conversation with the captain, and I'm asking them about their last trip to the demilitarized zone. And he's telling me we got beat up. The ship got beat up, but we didn't lose anything. I want you to know, hear what I'm saying. Life is going to beat you up, but it don't have to take you out. Nor does it have to destroy your faith. 
what's interesting is that we understand from Sunday's message that there are levels of faith. I did not cover this, and I won't go into a lot of detail, but I'll give them to you if, in fact, Donald, they're already there. What I call levels of faith, and there are several levels of faith in Scripture, and you might want to capture them. Number one, we have what's called common faith. Common faith is faith that's just faith in general. All believers have common faith. And I'll give you a scripture for each one. The first one, watch this, is Titus 1 and 4. Titus 1 and 4. We can see in that verse, Selena, common faith. It says, Titus, a true son in our common faith. That means this should be common in our life. Faith should be a common faith. All right, so that's number one. A level of faith is common faith. Number two, embrace this. Weak faith. Weak faith is also given to us in Scripture. And note this passage, Romans 15 and 1. Romans 15 and 1, Minister Larry says, We then, that are strong in faith, ought to bear the infirmities of the weak, and not to please ourselves. Oh, Bishop, I've never read it that way before. We then that are strong are to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Romans 15 and 1. What that is saying, Linda, is that your faith is not just for yourself. Your faith is not just for yourself. It's whenever my faith gets weak that I need your faith to be strong. All right? So there will be moments. Everybody say with me, moments. moments. There will be moments, moments when you might be going through a season of weak faith. That don't mean it bothers you. That means that you've got to work your faith more now. But it may get weak. Here is the third one. The third level of faith that I want to share with you is called great faith. Great faith. Matthew 8, 8 through 10. Great faith. You can see it now projected on the screen. Here it says, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith. Notice this. I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. All right? This is Matthew. Verses 8 through 10. All right, again, we're talking about great faith. Lord, I am not worthy. But he said, this is the, the centurion, the military leader. 
was not an apostle, was not a prophet, was not a minister. <laughs> this man was a heathen. What that tells us, Kiyosha, is that everybody can have great hope. They don't have to be in church. And you're going to run into people who actually have great faith, and then they are looking at you like, why don't you? <laughs> they have great faith. A lot of times, they will say things that will convict you. Because you should be telling them that. You should be saying something that reflects great faith. And it's coming from someone who you will never think. And that's why Jesus often complimented children. Because children don't think. They just act. And sometimes, get this, thinking gets in the way of faith. Thinking gets in the way of acting out your faith. I rebuke people, darling, because I said to them, And let me tell you, you deserve it. Let me tell you that when you overthink something, you cancel your faith. You paralyze your faith because you're overthinking it. I'll give you an example. A person who is not Just act on faith. And we have multiple examples in the Bible. The woman with the issue of blood, Dennis, did not think about it. Didn't even think about it. Now, watch this. The woman with the issue of blood knew that, according to Jewish tradition, when you have that kind of You don't go out and talk. She was considered unclean. We can discuss it later. But trust me for now. This woman had an issue of blood, which indicated that her problem was a chronic problem that would not stop. She knew that in her tradition, she could not be out in public. She did not even think about it. She heard Jesus was coming. She pressed her way knowing she was unclean. And with her unclean faith hand touched the hem of his robe. She didn't overthink it. She didn't let the crowd cause her to become immobilized in her faith. She pressed away. Let me tell you, there will be some people who will not give you permission to use your faith. Are you listening? Hello? There will be some people who will tell you, you don't have permission. I'll give you an example. An example is, you're off Sunday. But they're determined to make you work. And you have to tell them, not today. I'm going to be in the house of God. And so, it might appear that your job is in jail. But who gave you the freedom? Thank you. Who's your source? All right? So, the point is, you will always write it down you will always come in conflict with faith circumstances that is for the purpose of forcing your faith to work. And so, there's a song that says, 
say no. If God says yes, you're not permitted to say no. And you say, well, Bishop, suppose I say no, but God wants me to say yes. I'll tell you what's going to happen. He is going to delay your blessing. He won't deny it, but he could delay your blessing because he already told you yes. And so if you say no, when God already said yes, he's forcing you to work your faith. If you choose not to do it, he won't throw you away if you won't do it. But he could delay your blessing. God has a lot of time. So you've got to work your faith. Let's move on. All right? And God will force your faith to work. I'll give you two more. Number four, active faith. Active faith. In John 15 and 7, active faith. In John 15 and 7, it says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. So active faith, ask. Faith is a action word. And so in John 15 and 7, it says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. I'm going to tell you this, and it's true, and it's real. Some people who are believers are afraid to ask God something about them. How can faith and fear coexist? One cancels the other. So a lot of times what happens is that you're fighting off fear in order to force your faith. And the two cannot coexist. And so you've got to work through that. You've got to deal with that. You've got to overcome the fear so your faith can work. And, and so it says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Some people hear me, and I want to say to our Facebook friends right now, I want you to know that the scripture is true. You have not because you ask. And some people are afraid to ask because they think it's too hard. I don't want to ask that. God says, ask me. If, notice the, the, the scripture, John 15 and 7. If you abide in me, that means you are already in him. Abiding in him, living in God, experiencing God, gives you the right to ask what you want. And he actually told you, ask me for this. I, I would dare to say that there's a lot of things we want that we have not asked for. And God says, I'm waiting. Why didn't you ask? There's something about abiding in God that causes you to ask God what you might be afraid to ask. So that passage is active faith. Your faith has to be active. I don't know how you come to Spirit of Liberty and hear me preach about faith almost every Sunday and not have active faith. You've got to have 
slumber. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you, you rebuke yourself because it's easy to stay in bed, put the cover over your head, uh, uh, just bathe in depression and say, uh, you, you have to take authority over it and you've got to speak to your situation for your faith to be active. Get out of that bed. Understand, watch this, that all of us have problems. Nobody is exempt. They may not look like it, but they're going through something too. They have some pain. They're dealing with something. So you don't have the right to be depressed. When the Bible says, in Isaiah, the prophet said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he talks about putting on the garment of praise. But the spirit of heaviness, that's depression. And there are levels, you know. There's also oppression. And let me drop this nugget on you. The difference between depression and oppression, get this. Depression comes upon you when you feel overwhelmed by something. Oppression, on the other hand, is when it comes out of nowhere. It's like, why am I feeling this way? That may not be depression. That could be oppression. Because the enemy will try to oppress you, get you to a place where you can't seem to Oppression and depression. But depression, get this, is a human function. Oppression is a demonic and spiritual function. And that's the difference. So a lot of times you become oppressed, you think you're depressed. But you're oppressed because you want to do something but you can't seem to do it. Oppression. Is real just like depression is real. One comes when you're not doing anything, and another comes because you're doing something. All right, we can deal with that later. All right, but notice this. I'll give you the last one. If you are taking notes, number one, we're talking about five levels of faith. Number one, Number two, weak faith. Number three, great faith. And great faith is Matthew 8, verses 8 and 10. All right? Active faith, John 15 and 7. Strong faith, Romans 4, 20 and 21. All right, I'm going to start moving towards my conclusion with this. Romans 4, 20 and 21. Strong faith. One writer, Carlette, puts it this way. I believe another term for strong faith might be root. when things do not seem to be going as requested of God. This is the way to get tangible answers from God, ruthless faith. Believe in God when nothing is happening. Another scripture, uh, the scripture I just mentioned, Romans 4, 20 and 21. Speaking of Abraham, Theosian, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened or strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he, God, had promised, he, God, was able to perform. He was strong in faith. This is Abraham, Romans 4, 20 and 21. Now, let me close with this. When Jesus is now in the boat with his disciples, he challenges them by asking the question, where 
means that Jesus, so they know, was expecting them to do something. You can't depend on other people's faith all the time. You've got to understand that God has given to you a measure of faith. Use it. Use it. And so he says in verse 25, where is your faith? And they were afraid and marveled. Fear always answers prayer. Fear always answers prayer. Fear always answers faith. But faith always answers prayer. You miss it. Fear always cancels faith. But faith always cancels fear. All right? And so now, in verse 26, it says, then they sailed from the country of the Galileans, which is opposite Galilee. And when he had stepped out uh, on the land, there met him a certain man from the city who he had beaten for a long time, and he wore no clothes. This man had said, when Jesus asked him, what is your name? He answered, Legion. And I want you to write this down. This term, legion, is a military term that could represent thousands of legions. Thousands of demons. All right, you have to understand that demons want to be seen. So they want to bother. And you have to understand that the reason why the demons did not want Jesus to cast them into the abyss is because demons don't want to die. So they want a body that they can live in. All right? So notice, they ask permission. Isn't that interesting? Look at verse 30. Jesus asked him, saying, what is your name? And he said, Legion, because many demons had entered him. And they, the demons, begged him. Is that in your Bible? The demons begged him that he would not command them to go into the abyss or what is out of darkness. Okay? Now I heard a swine this evening. They begged him that he would permit them to enter them and he permitted them. In other words, the demons didn't want to die. They wanted to continue to exist in You know, animals have spirits. Animals have spirits. All right? And, and so, uh, I want you to notice this. That whenever Jesus talks about this man's demon, his demon has a name. And I want you to know, whenever you come under demonic attack, it has a name too. When you know your demon's name, you know how to better handle it. You say, but Bishop, I don't have a demon. You would be surprised. <laughs> oh, Bishop, not me. I don't have a demon. Yeah, when you act out of character and you do something out of character, that's a spirit. Yeah. And you bring it to church with you, too. And if somebody rub you wrong at church, you come out. Oh, yeah, yeah, you, you are Christian. Yeah, Christians can have demons. You can, oh, my God, this is, <laughs> I, I want you to hear me. All right? They, they have spirits. Christians can have demons, too. Yeah. You act out. The best thing you can do when that happens is go to church. Get in your car. Pray your way out. Okay? And so, uh, it is interesting. It is interesting. 
this man uh, uses the term legion, all right? And a legion is, note this, for the 6,000 troops. For the 6,000. All right, what that tells me, Darby, is that one spirit, one person, rather, can have many spirits. But notice that they attack him, and notice where he was living, in the graveyard, and when Jesus approached him and asked him, what is your name? He said, a legion. Hear me. For the 6,000 demons. They don't take no spirit. They can be in a person. All right? This is a subject for another time. But I tell people, gentlemen, if you're not called for deliverance, don't play with it. Don't, don't play with it. Because if you're not prepared, if you're not trained, if you're not ready, you can be overcome. You could bite off of more than you could chew. All right? So this man had several demons. Whenever Jesus ministered, there were occasions when he would tell people not to say anything. Okay, don't, don't say anything. What's interesting here is that he does the opposite. Have you noticed? Let's look at the conclusion. All right? And in this passage, he does just And I'm skipping for the sake of time. But in verse 39 of Luke 8, but Jesus sent them away saying, get this link, sent them away saying, return to your own house and tell, and tell what great things God has done for you. And he went his way and proclaimed throughout the whole what great things Jesus had done for him. So it was when Jesus returned that the multitude welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. Now, here is another one. I want you to get this. Jesus strategically, all right, would tell people not to say Tells the man, go and tell. What is interesting, Minister Brown, is that the people who Jesus tells not to tell are demons. In this case, the man is a Gentile, and Jesus is preaching in a Gentile area, and he says, Go spread the word. Because they need to believe. But he tells Jewish people that he ministers to not to say anything because they would try to kill them in Jesus. It wasn't the unsafe people that hindered his ministry. It was the Jewish believing people who hindered his ministry. So he would say to Jewish people, don't But in a Gentile area, he would say to this man, go tell. I want to say that for kingdom people, being led by God in who you tell will cause the salvation. Be led by not Jewish, 
you're Gentile. But you've got to use wisdom in who you tell what God is telling you. If you think that is something, wait till Sunday morning. You have to understand that even believers should not be told something. You should not tell every believer something. It was the believers that actually caused Jesus most problems. Most of his problems was people who didn't know. Be careful. Another way of looking at it, they can't handle the problem. They can't handle it. So you have to be led by to whom you share the heart of God with. I'll take it to another level. Pray with me, Father, I thank you that we've had a chance tonight. And navigate again in Luke chapter 1. And I thank you, Lord, that I understand that there will be certain things that will force my faith to work. I must make a decision that I'm going to do something by faith and not flesh. I'm going to do something by the leading of God, not emotion. I'm going to trust God and so, Father, I'm asking now that you would burn this word in our hearts and help us to look at the different levels of faith and ask ourselves, where are we? What level are we at? So, Father, I pray for your people. I pray, God, for this season, this life we're living right now in 2022. It's In a storm, where is your faith? So I thank you, Lord, that you will not exempt us from storms, but you will push us in the storm to do something by faith. Thank you, Lord, for giving us. Satan is the prince and power of the air. Trust me, all of the people in New Orleans that survived that devastating tornado, some storms are not sent by God. Satan had power yet. God gave Satan. I'll give you this one scripture because I didn't cover it. It is in Psalm 107 and verse 29, Psalm 107, verse 29, Psalm 107, verse 29. That psalm tells us that God does send us to us. God does send us. If God sent the storm, Jesus would not have rebuked it. So in Psalm 107 29, we can understand that there are some storms that God controls. This one, however, seems to have been. 
live on. Because it came at a time when Jesus was going to minister deliverance to the man called Legion. Understand, hear me, that when things get really difficult, sometimes there's a demon to minister to the Lord. Sometimes the devil has to be. But there's a demonic power working to make it that way. And then there are people who are very gifted, as I said earlier, some people really will overthink a situation. There will be times when people will be overly open to a spirit to make things worse. They're making it worse. You don't have to. You can give it to God. You don't have to. You can truly give it to God. Faith gives stuff to God. When flesh takes stuff into its own hands. That's how you know you can have the spirit. Because Another time, another time, we're going to pray and be dismissed, and I'm going to ask for those of you that would like to share your tithes and offerings, help me with it, Linda, uh, if you need an envelope, raise your hand, raise your hand, all right, anyone needing an envelope, raise your hand, everybody just sign that and give it to me, okay, and I'm going to ask that you share Thank you for joining us. This was our Go Deeper Bible study, and we're going to share it on YouTube too, brothers, if we can. And I'm going to share it with people around the world who are not, uh, who don't have Facebook. And so I just want you to know that we're praying for you, and we're standing and believing God in this season. All right? Don't allow yourself. To overthink a thing and don't allow yourself to allow Satan to use you. No, I'm doing it after I say To do too much. You're doing too much. And people get discouraged when you do it too much. You need to tell them you're doing too much. You're doing it too much. Father, I ask your blessings upon our time and offerings. And I thank you, Lord. Tonight, we went deeper from our service on Sunday. And I am convinced, Lord, that we need this word in this season. Because God, the circumstances we're facing right now in a post pandemic world, Lord, we know that there's warfare going on. We know that things are on another level. And our faith must be there. So help us, God. Help us to live by faith and to trust you in this time. Because we exist in all of this time. Burn this word in our hearts, Lord God, and we'll forever give you the glory and the glory. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 Give the Lord a clap offering. To my Facebook friends and to all who are following us on Facebook Live, if you want to also give, you can do it by Cash App, you can give by PayPal, you can also give by text to give, right? And as I release us tonight, if there's any special prayer requests, we'll take those prayer requests. Don't forget, we have seminary 